weaknesses, growth areas that you bring into your marriage. They're usually not created from your marriage. They're brought into your marriage and your partner is bringing in their stuff as well. And so now you got two imperfect people living side by side, day in and day out, and then sparks start to fly. And so step two is all about owning your brokenness. So being able to identify what are your top three growth areas as a partner, and then what are your partner's top three growth areas, and then to identify the vicious cycles, because most of the time... Hello, and welcome to another amazing episode of TMC, where we are here to help you take your relationships from, from surviving, surviving to thriving. thriving. And if this is your first time joining us, don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, hit the notification bell, and go ahead and share so you won't miss any amazing episodes. Today on TMC, we have Owning Your Brokenness with Dr. Wyatt Fisher. Everybody. I'm a psychologist in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I've been in private practice since 2004 and I specialize in couples counseling. So I eat and breathe working with couples. That's all I do. Um, and I've been married myself since 1999 and my own relationship has had a lot of peaks and valleys. So I help couples from both a personal and professional perspective because of my personal experience and clinical experience and my education background. Awesome. So do you have any kids? Four. Yeah, we have four kids. They're from 13 to 19. Wow. And so, yeah, we have our hands full and we've okay. gone through all sorts of stuff, as you can imagine, with kids and teens in this day and age. So, yeah, we're also in the trenches with other parents, you know, going through the similar experiences. Absolutely. And tell us a little bit about your six marriage steps. Yeah, so these steps are something, it's a sequence that I developed several years ago when, you know, working with so many couples in my practice, and I really wanted to try to broaden the impact to help more couples, similar to you guys with this, with this podcast. And so I developed a marriage conference about eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, called the Total Marriage Refresh. Mm. And in that conference, I just started working through, you know, what are the main modules, the main steps that I really want to help couples in. And as I started merging together my personal experience, clinical experience, education backgrounds, I came up with these six steps. Um, and then they include all sorts of things in them to really help couples go from ground zero up to developing a healthy, successful relationship. Awesome. So as you've worked with couples, like you said, and from your own experience, one out of the six steps you can tell us a little bit about. Yeah. One of the steps is number two, which is owning your brokenness. Oh, and so, yeah, yeah. So I define brokenness by the culmination of all your shortcomings, weaknesses, growth areas that you bring into your marriage. They're usually not created from your marriage. They're brought into your marriage and your partner is bringing in their stuff as well. And so now you got two imperfect people living side by side, day in and day out, and then sparks start to fly. And so step two is all about owning your brokenness. So being able to identify what are your top three growth areas as a partner? And then what are your partner's top three growth areas? And then to identify the vicious cycles, because most of the time partner A's growth areas interact with partner B's growth areas, and they got these two to three vicious cycles going on. So if people can identify what that is and then own their part. It helps explain the majority of their conflicts and it also helps them see how they're contributing to them and what they can work on to make things better. It comes up in all sorts of ways. It contributes to most of the conflicts, you know, these growth areas we have. Um, in step two, I also talk about the strengths. So it's also the uh, top growth areas and the top strengths. Um, so then you have this list of, okay, here's my top strengths of the partner and here's my top brokenness areas. And by the way, your partner should have the final say on what your brokenness areas are, not you. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, because we all have our own self-serving bias and we're, you know, skewed sometimes with how we see ourselves. Yeah. So I have people make a list of what they think their top three are and then ask their partner, would you agree with these? Would you disagree? And their partner has the final say on what yeah. theirs is um, just because they're more objective. But out of that, out of the growth areas and the strengths comes a tool. And so the tool is called the bullseye question. Mm. And it's not complicated. It's not elaborate, but it's a very powerful tool. And what the tool is, 
is once a day, get in the habit of asking your partner, what's one thing I did right today? And what's one thing I could have done better? Mm. Now, there's a ground rule. That's the most important part so that this doesn't lead to defensiveness. And the ground rule is all you're allowed to say in response to that is, thank you for the feedback. Mm, but once wow. you get that, once you get the feedback, you can put that feedback into one of three buckets in your mind as you mull it over. The one bucket you might put it in is, oh, that was a one-off, you know, that constructive feedback they gave me, that was a one-off, that wasn't my fault at all. Um, that was just like a, a fluke that they thought was me, but it really wasn't. So I can just put that feedback into that one bucket. Um, other times, the other bucket might be, that was all me. Mm. What, what they I really got to work on that. What they just highlighted, you know, that was a hundred percent me. I got to really work on that. That's another bucket it might go into, but most of the time it's going to go into this middle bucket and that middle bucket is okay. What they just said about me, that constructive feedback, some of that was me. Some of that was not me. That was not all my fault. You know, I had, there's all these other variables going on, but I can't say that was not me at all. Mm. So that the mulling over the process there is you're in control to decide what part of the feedback is legit, Mm. what piece of the feedback you feel like was you. And that creates a lot of freedom because a lot of times when we get constructive feedback, there's this expectation that we have to swallow all of it. (laughs) And because I don't swallow all of it, I'm going to push back and get defensive. So because it's a ground rule, all I can say is thank you for the feedback. And then it's up to me to decide what the kernel of truth is. Now we've just sidestepped defensiveness. We sidestepped the whole power battle. I can mull it over and then I can latch on to what I think is the kernel of truth met feedback. And now I'm self-motivated to want to work on it. Wow. Because you said yeah. something, I actually thought about this mm-hmm. and then you said it about jumping on the defense. And I mm-hmm. think I, I, I'm I'm guilty of this. Yeah. Uh, she's guilty of yeah, this, yeah, this you know, jumping yeah. on this defense. I want to kind of talk, you know, just really helping us with the, I guess with the process of what's happening, why, why, why do we, why do we go there? Why do right away we put up defense mechanism and we're ready to dispute whatever's being said, whether it's the truth or not, we just kind of go into this victim mindset. Why is that? Yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of reasons, but one of them is because we're getting blindsided. Mm. Most of the time people don't have a very good filter with, I'm about ready to critique my partner. They just Mm. do it. And because they're upset and they're frustrated in the moment or something's happening and they just can't take it anymore. So they just randomly blindside their partner and no one likes to be blindsided. Mm. Wow. And And so what I tell couples I work with, with this bullseye question is that's the only time you're allowed to bring up any critique. It's the only time you're allowed to bring out any complaint. Mm. And because of that, when you go into the bullseye time with your partner, you know, okay, we're about ready to give and receive feedback. So now I'm kind of mentally prepared. Prepared. I'm I'm prepping myself. And because I'm asking for the feedback, I'm asking what I do, right. I'm asking how, what could I have done better? That means I'm coming out of a position of power. Mm. And so automatically I'm going to receive that feedback better compared to you. If you just randomly critique me and I don't see it coming and I'm not ready for it. That's good. I like that. The bullseye question. What did I do good? What did I do right this week? And what can I do better? Wow. I yeah. like that. I yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like I, I definitely like the fact that you you gave us the picture of what we're doing when we have this time set aside. Because you said oftentimes the reason why we have that, you know, defense mechanism or we go up and feel the defense and that we need to defend ourselves is because you're being blindsided. And I think as you said that I never thought about the fact of when I'm telling somebody something, it's like, I mean, it's the truth. Either you're at your breaking point where you've had enough or, you know, it's in the moment and it really bothers you. And you don't think that you just like side swapping them out of Mm -hmm. nowhere. And that's why you can't get in. And, And it makes me think about when you talk to a couple and they say, we keep having the same problem over and over, or he just won't listen or she just won't listen. They're not understanding what I'm saying. And then I started to think like, how many times is that happening? That the person is being blindsided with the critique, the complaint or whatever it is. Uh So having this bullseye moment, this bullseye question to be able to know that each week we're going to sit down and talk about it. And then you gave us clear instructions that it's only that one time that you could do this. Uh There's only, 
it at one time a week. So you're not having a bullseye moment every single day. And that's, I think that's great. That's awesome. That, that was a nugget to me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And, and actually it's supposed to be every day. Oh, every day. Okay. Every okay. Day. Okay. Because things, right. things build up, you know, so if something happens on Monday, it's going to be really hard to wait until the following Saturday <laughs> to talk about it. Exactly. I th- for some reason, I thought he said, when you talk, do it once a week. Okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah. So okay. it creates a daily time to clear the air, to open up lines of communication. Yes, and it, it prompts you to look for the good stuff because we're not good at looking at the good stuff. We're good at looking at the growth areas. Yeah. True, true, right? true. So yeah. every day, every day you have to think about what did they do right today? Mm. You know, what, what did I appreciate or what did I admire? That's a great daily practice just for cultivating gratitude. And then it gives you that daily time to air out any negative feelings so that they don't build up. And some nights there might not be any negative Right. Yeah. They, they may ask you like, Hey, you know, what, what, what's one thing I could have done better today. And you may say, I can't think of anything today. Mm. And so those are wins, right? Those are like victory days when that oh, happens. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. What I love about it is like, I mean, eventually, I mean, we we would all love to get to the get to that point where, you know, you say, man, it's nothing. I mean, More everything was awesome. Nothing, right? yeah. And then you start having a lot of days of that. Then it just changes a uh, perspective of your marriage and now your marriage just went from good and now you have a great marriage yeah. and everything's amazing because now those bullseye moments can be utilized to you know even for that positive affirmation you know yeah. as well even during that time yeah. and man the reason why i love this so much i mean because this is really not only is it helping the marriage but it's preventing things because you have a lot of relationships where people you know you have that silent and violent individual and that person goes silent don't say anything Mm -hmm. and five years has went by and they didn't say anything about all the things they do not like and now they already drift away silently in five years which i don't think that's fair for the individual that that happened to where you haven't told them anything and now you're ready to get a divorce i think that's i think that's unfair as well that's that's another blind side so that's the massive blind side right there yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. that's exactly right you know because it's very common for your partner to do something that hurts your feelings or something that bothers you something uh, that offends you then the problem is how do i bring that stuff up mm. because if i bring it up and they get defensive i don't want to start a fight so now i'm just going to stuff it uh, or i'm yeah. going to blow up or yeah. i'm going to get passive aggressive or i'm going to withdraw and so this bullseye just creates a really proactive constructive method to daily let's just bring up that stuff but if we follow that ground rule then it keeps it safe because it doesn't work if we do the bullseye and either partner starts to get defensive because then that just says it's not safe to bring up what i feel right right so that ground rule of you only can respond with thank you for the feedback that's all you can say and then knowing that it's up to me after I get that feedback where I can mull it over and sift through that kernel of truth of the piece yeah. I think I need to work on. Yeah. That's a really critical ground rule because otherwise it can erupt in defensiveness. Yeah. And then you feel like, why are we doing this? You're just getting defensive. Yeah. Right, right, right. Dr. Watts, I would love for you to do something. So I wrote this down and I think this is great. You said the only thing you're allowed to say is thanks for the feedback. I, mm. I want you to kind of explain the why why is yeah. this important for mm-hmm. you to say thank you for the feedback instead of getting and you get into this 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 war zone yeah it's really about creating safety and so safety when i when i say that word safety it means i want to be able to bring up both the good stuff and especially the constructive feedback and feel like it's safe to do so mm. and that means my partner does not get defensive they don't turn it around on me they don't blame it on someone else. They don't get you know, upset because if any of those things happen, I don't want to bring up that feedback. And now I'm just stuffing that feedback and now I'm pulling away in the relationship. Mm-hmm. So creating safety is huge and critical for couples. And that ground rule helps create safety. And when I first tell couples to do it, they're scared. You know, they're mm-hmm. like, ah, I'm scared to bring up the constructive feedback because I don't want them to get defensive. I was like, well, that's why that ground rule is there. So they can't get defensive. Mm. Uh, So by saying thank you for the feedback, it expresses respect, right? Thank you for giving me feedback. And it feels amazing to hear that after you've given feedback. Absolutely. But then that caveat is so critical, which which is 
once you get that feedback, it's up to you to decide what's the kernel of truth in the feedback. You get to choose that. You get to mull that over. And that creates freedom. Mm. And so, again, that's where there's no expectation that this feedback is 100% correct and you have to swallow all of it. That's not yeah. the expectation. I get to sift through that feedback and figure out what's my part in this. Mm. And because I'm in control of that, I don't have to get defensive. I can move forward. I can take a step toward that. And now my motivation to follow through is much higher as well because I don't feel put into a corner and attacked. <laughs> it's definitely good. It's awesome and amazing. And I'm thinking as you talk and I'm just thinking about it and I'm like, wow, it's setting the ground for so much openness and authenticity and just to be transparent and honest with your partner, with your spouse to be able to say, you know, what you're feeling and to know. Then on the flip side for the person that receives it, it's, like okay what is my responsibility because i i heard you keep saying that and i think that that's a definitely a key for the person is for when you're receiving the feedback to be able to understand and to have the ground rule that you still have the responsibility to choose what part is actually you what's mm -hmm. not you and what you're going to do about it point forward because sometimes i think that there's also a misconception that because someone says something if they feel a certain way you automatically feel like okay what they're saying is true they they believe that what they're saying is true what they're saying is true and like you said i have to swallow it but that's not necessarily true because there may be variables to it you told oh, yeah. us that as well there may be variables to it that says all of this is not me or either yeah all of this was me and i need to work on it and so it's like you're putting the responsibility back to the person that's receiving the feedback it's my responsibility to decide afterwards what i'm going to do with it i love that right. i love right. that in the the major process when you give and receive feedback with the bullseye it doesn't take long first of all it takes maybe five minutes mm. you know because all you say is hey what's one thing i did right today what's one thing i could have done better yeah. by the way it's important to say one thing <laughs> <laughs> so your yeah. partner doesn't list off five things you could have done better oh, uh, so to say what's one thing i did right what's one thing i could have done better so that takes about five minutes to answer those questions as long as you're following the ground rule. Thank you for the feedback. The time intensity happens when you start mulling over the feedback because mm -hmm. that may take a few hours. That may take a day or two. You know, it's, it's hard to process feedback with your partner right there Yeah, because it does feel a little threatening when you get the feedback. And again, that's part of that freedom of you don't have to, you don't have to do anything with that feedback in the moment. You don't have to respond to that feedback. You're just, receiving that feedback and then you're going to take it with you and so then as you go about your day you go to the gym you're driving to work whatever that's when you can start mulling it over and really thinking about okay what part of that was me if any maybe none of it was or maybe all of it was but most likely there was a piece there that i probably could have done better something i can consider for the next time mm. a little adjustment i could probably make for the future yeah. i'm going to be much more likely to mold that over by myself, mm. right? Compared to if I'm expected to respond to it in the moment in front of my partner when they just delivered that feedback, because I might feel a little flustered hearing it. I might feel a little taken aback, even though we're doing the bullseye. Yeah. So that's another nice thing is that there's no expectations. You don't have to respond at all. And actually you're not supposed to respond. So you get that freedom of just mulling it over by yourself in your own time so that you can just kind of think through it. Um, you may conclude that, you know, what, I think like 20% of that was me, or yeah. I think maybe 60% of that was me. And you never say that percentage out loud. You never want to tell your partner <laughs> what the percentage was. Yeah. <laughs> um, you roll that over. Uh, but again, it, it just creates a nice flow to feedback and opens up lines of communication, accentuates the good, and it gets out the bat. Dr. Watt, I want you to explain one thing I did right. You always say that question first. Why is it so important to say, start off with that question before you say, what can I do better? Yeah, it's, it's the adage, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, mm. right? So if you start with the good stuff first, it kind of builds up your partner before you deliver the constructive feedback. Yes. And some people will say, oh, I don't care. Just give me the negative first. <laughs> and that's up to them. You know, they can do that. But I think on average, it will go best if you hear the good stuff first and then you hear the growth. So, Dr. White, let's talk a little bit about emotional intimacy. What is one step that the TMC listeners, the couples can take? 
to get closer to emotional intimacy? Yeah, emotional intimacy, the way I define emotional intimacy is knowing your partner's inner world and then knowing yours. And so that inner world includes all sorts of things, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're feeling. Uh, one analogy that John Gottman has used is the term love map, where if you think about Houston, since you guys are in Houston, think about a map of Houston today compared to 20 years ago, compared mm -hmm. to 50 years ago, compared to 100 years ago. There's always new buildings, new yeah. roads, new bridges, and we're very similar. So we're constantly evolving inter internally inside of us with mm. what, what's our highs, what's our lows, what's stressing us out, what are we excited about, what are we yeah. scared about? All of that is constantly moving. And so if we need a method, a way to stay updated on our partner, or we'll get outdated very quickly. Wow. The first step is resolving resentments. Mm. So when you're together with a partner for any length of time, there's a high chance there's going to be unresolved resentments mm. and resentments just builds walls very quickly between you and your partner yeah. and emotional intimacy is impossible when there's active resentments. Um, most things are impossible when there's active resentments. It's hard to want to go on dates with your partner. It's hard to want to have sex with your partner. It's hard to cultivate emotional intimacy with your partner when there's active resentments. Yeah. And resentments are just, some, you know, they're just part and parcel to long-term relationships. And so when I'm working with couples in my practice, the first thing I do with every couple that comes through my door is I have them make a list of all their resentments. Mm -hmm. And they, and I, we talk about common categories of resentment so they can kind of think of resentments along categories such as finances or parenting or uneven workload or physical intimacy or emotional intimacy, in-laws, so mm. many things can come into play when it comes to resentments. And the reason I start with resentments is because of what I just said, because nothing else is going to go well until we get those resentments addressed. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and since we're talking about that, and you also mentioned that we're constantly growing, we're constantly changing, just like the city does. We're growing, we're changing, things are different about us. Let's talk a little bit about seasons. You also teach about the seasons of marriage. Could you tell us a little bit about the seasons, what they are and a little bit about them? Yeah. So Gary Chapman wrote a book on the seasons of marriage. And so it's a great analogy that I love to talk about. And what it is, is basically every marriage goes through four seasons, just like our actual seasons. Mm. So you start off in summer and that's when everything's hot. You know, just like outdoors, everything's hot, everything's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Uh, you're not wearing very many clothes because it's so hot outside. And this is the first stage of a relationship. That's the infatuation stage where your partner's invincible in your eyes. They can do no wrong. And you're just head over heels. Wow. That's summer. After summer comes fall. So cool fall is where the be. leaves leaves start to fall off the trees. Things are getting a little cooler. You're starting to put more clothes on. <laughs> and so in, in, in a relationship, <laughs> in a relationship, that's where some resentments are starting to creep in. Mm. And you, you might still be in love, but maybe not as in love. Maybe your needs aren't being met as well as they were in the beginning. And so this is when couples have been together for, you know, maybe a few years. Uh, after that, if you don't nip those issues in the bud, if you don't address those little cracks that are coming in, you'll go into winter. Mm. winter is when we've got some full-blown resentments our needs are definitely not being met i don't feel in love anymore and this is where a lot of relationships break if they're not careful so just like our weather outside in winter it's frigid it's cold you're all the way bundled up you have no mm. part of you exposed mm. and if you step on a branch in winter it's wow. fragile it oh breaks winter is a one of the worst places to be but for couples who are committed to more of a long-term approach and, and they really want to work through winter, they can. Yeah, and that's that. where couples can reach out to podcasts. That's where couples can go to conferences. That's where yes. they can start using apps. They can start seeing a therapist or a coach. So for couples who put in the work, and if they're both teachable and willing, they can move out of winter and go into spring. Mm. spring just like our weather that's when the, the warmth starts coming back and the birds start chirping and there's a fragrance in the air and you start taking some of your clothes off because it's warm outside yeah. so in marriage that's where you start healing your resentments and you start falling back in love and you start tending to each other's needs again mm. so the main benefit of that is you can 
think about your marriage in those terms and realize it's normal to go through these seasons because when people hit winter, often they draw false conclusions. They'll think I must have married the wrong person mm. or I'm never going to be happy in this relationship or I'm not in love. This must be over. Those things might be true, but what also might be true is you're just going through winter and it's a normal season in every relationship. Wow. 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 And I, I want to ask you to do something for me. So this is for the couple that's listening to this podcast. They are experiencing winter right now. They find themselves in the season of winter. Can you give them a practical step, some advice for how they can make the first step toward spring again? Yeah. Hmm. The first step would be writing out a list of all your resentments. That's the first step. Wow. You know, those are a couple analogies with resentments. One is if you're planting, you can't have rocks in your soil or the plants won't establish roots. Wow. And those rocks in the soil are your resentments. So your marriage is not going to grow unless you first dig out those rocks. Mm. Or another analogy might be, think of your pipes in your house, like your sink or your toilet. When that gets clogged, the water can't flow. Mm -hmm. And so that clog in a relationship is a resentment. And so you have to get out those resentments be before the water can start flowing. So the first step would be, let's make a list of all my resentments and all of your resentments. So at least we see what needs to be addressed before we can get out of winter and start entering into spring. Mm. Yeah. And once you make that list of resentments, then it's a matter of what do you do with them? Mm hmm. Right. And so there's a tool that I teach called the reunite tool. And that tool is to train couples on how to talk through those resentments in a way that keeps things emotionally safe. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of couples can't even touch the topic because it blows up into yeah. a conflict. Mm -hmm. And so there, you can look up on Google reunite tool and it should come up at the top or close to the top. And that in that article that I wrote at the bottom is a table for how to follow the reunite tool. So you want to bring out that table and look at it as a couple, read that article together, pull out that table. So you're both on the same page, similar to a football team looking at the same playbook. Mm. Both know the ground rules of how are we going to talk through these resentments? Here's the table to do it. And so try that and go through that one resentment at a time. And then if you find you, we can't even do that table without erupting, then that means you might need to work with a coach or a counselor to help you go through those resentments with the reunite tool. This is amazing, man. We thank you so much for sharing this amazing information to the TMC community. If someone wanted to connect with you and what you're doing, where should they go? My podcast is probably the best spot. So they can look up the, the uh, Dr. Wyatt Show podcast um, and check out my episodes. They're pretty short, about 10 to 15 minutes, and they're very practical. So it's all about you know four steps to do this, five steps to do that. It's the Dr. Wyatt Show podcast. I'm also on Instagram and TikTok, and the handle is marriage underscore Dr. Wyatt. We thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank yes, you so yes. much. So we want to thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, go ahead and subscribe. Click the like button and turn on your notifications so you'll be notified each time we upload a video. So we want to thank you for joining us today on TMC. Looking forward to hanging out with you again on next week as we continue to help you take your relationship from, from surviving, surviving to thriving. Bye. See you next week. week.